welcome to the uh, Red Dwarf panel. Just to quickly introduce everybody, my, I'm Robert Llewellyn, Danny John Jules, oh. Rob Grunt, uh, genius writer and uh, supreme producer entrepreneur, Joe Nazaro, supreme author of uh, many, many books on uh, uh -huh. uh, science fiction uh, related subjects, including the making of Red Dwarf. Uh -huh. Um, just a quick request, when, when you are, want to ask a question, if you put your hand up and we'll see you and then just speak into a microphone. You put your so, hand up and so you give it a so mic. Um, we can hear you. And, um, and speak like there. As opposed to this There, we can't hear it. If it's there, we can. That's all. And then, and then the, the, the tape things can hear it. And then Danny's going to sing a song for an hour and a half. But the only drawback is he doesn't, he doesn't know the words. Somebody please ask a question quickly. I don't know the words. Just go ahead now. We've been hearing this We've been doing quite often. Since Friday. Or was it Friday? Anyway, anyway, so let's, can we have a, a question? Over there. Yes. How tough is it to live with Chris Berry now he's appeared in Top Gear magazine? Didn't quite catch that. Didn't quite catch that. <laughs> well, we didn't even know he was in Top Gear magazine, yeah. boy. Well, I oh, was it. Was well, it? I want to see it. Go on. I want to get a copy. Like, like a quadruple page folder. Right? Was that? Was that? He's got about ship? thirty cars, well, isn't he? How many cars were in the magazine? How many did he have? Eight or nine. Yeah, but I mean, eight or nine. That you know, you, the flies don't even land on. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's the, eight or nine. That's the eight or nine cars he keeps in the left hand side of the garage. The other he's, side. He's also got about 20 motorbikes as well, you know, including like World War II and he's got a... Uh, we all feel very, very emotionally we're threatened. Right. And we're not jealous at all. I feel I'm, I will have to have therapy when I get back to it to deal with it. Um, no, we'll tease the hell out of him when we see him next time. Yeah, it's not here, Chris. It's very exciting. Yes, indeed. We, now, we, all, we always take the mickey out of him, you know, about his cars and that, you know. Then he'll come in, you know, with a load of brochures of the new car he's bought, and then you see about 15 people who huddled around the table. Everybody's interested. Chris has actually moved out into a, a house in the country a few weeks ago, and um, I asked him, it's, a, it's one of these reconverted farmhouses. No cows, no chickens, no animals, just cars. So this is sort of a new sort of a farmhouse, I think. Is there supposed to be dead silence out there? Or? Go ahead, question. There's a question out there. Mike coming. That's Karen. I was just wondering, uh, I've seen the blooper reels uh, twice now, actually. But that joke you make about, you all sort of stand there and say, it's strawberry. Where did that come from? Oh, what, what is this? Extraordinary. Um, it actually is from a, a, a sportscaster. A sports he's a caster. famous British sportscaster. And he's called uh, David, Coleman. David Coleman. And he makes things that have, been, have come to be known as Coleman balls. Because he says... Have you ever, sorry, yeah. have you ever seen um, when England win the World Cup? Uh, and the, the, the commentator... Is it just David Coleman? Isn't no, it's it? Kenneth, Kenneth Wilson. Wilson. Oh, sorry. Good story, anyway. Good story. Good story. Yeah, wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's people were born when they were That's what's called an aside, by the way. <laughs> it, uh, anyway, so this man occasionally will, will uh, hold his... You know that those guys have an earpiece, which they yeah. listen to news coming in, and he's telling you, oh, the 333 at uh, Kempton Park, and then you're getting news over here about another score, and he goes, oh, oh it's 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 <laughs> so And then he'll say, it's probably um, uh, the Washington Redskins have just lost to the Dallas uh, Cowboys. But uh, and it was actually completely stolen from Chris, it was one of Chris Barry's impersonations, and when we all did it. We and eventually he now says that he doesn't impersonate David Coleman, he impersonates us, impersonating him, yeah. impersonating him Coleman. Exactly. One at the back there? All oh, right, back, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we were asking the Dwayne Dippy dance. The Dwayne Dippy dance? Do you remember the last night of filming Emo Hawk when you went out in the hallway outside Shepherdin with the whole get up and the teeth and everything and you regaled them with the Dwayne dance? Oh god, that's the that, that, you, know, you guys would know that dance anyway, you know, the old um, 70s yeah, T Rex and all that. You've got to do the dance, you've got to do the dance dance. Hey, it's simple, it's the old rock and roll. This is, this is how Dwayne Goodly dances, right? 
It's kind of a variation of the cat, you see. That's the one. That is the Duke of Dork, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it, it's the triple thick condoms. <laughs> By the way, Robert and Danny came up with an idea last year of doing Dwayne's World. Yeah. <laughs> and there was going to be the Dwayne rap at one point, nearly, wasn't there? <laughs> Uh, next question. <laughs> no, 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 that's it. All right, thanks very much. Good night. I oh, know, this one. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Have you now found the career of acting? What professional voice will you find? Should we each do that? I know we can't all do it because we're not all actors. <laughs> you, you what about you? All right. Um, tree surgeon. <laughs> I'd like to be a butch tree surgeon because they get to wear all those straps around here that clink and clank about with that still. And um, saw branches off trees, but in a really environmentally aware and caring way. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what I want to do. What tree surgeon? Tree surgeon. Is it my life? Oh. Uh, I don't know. Well, actually, when I, when I left school, uh, the first job I had was uh, working in a, a leather warehouse. There was loads of pieces of leather coming past me and I'd stick a sticker on it and write down what size it was. I did that for about mm, two weeks. <laughs> and then I worked on a building site. Then I worked uh, in a hair salon. And then I worked in a hospital, collecting all that blur and washing all those things out. In the, in the National Heart Hospital. The most famous heart transplant surgeon in Britain. I saw him operate every day. Open heart. <laughs> Serious stuff. But I don't think I would have done any of those jobs because they were too tiring. And you had to do the W word. <laughs> but I don't know, I don't know what I would have been, you know, probably in jail. <laughs> no, nah, nah, I'd have probably been a football or something silly like that. Physical, you know. Something physical, practical. Bobby uh, would be a writer. If you did something different, Rob, you'd be a writer. <laughs> now what would you what would you do if you were doing something different? Well is that the question? If yeah. You, if you hadn't been a writer. I I would have um, I I would like to have helped Ladies dress after stripping in a, a strip joint. <laughs> good job. That is a good job. Yeah. Yeah. That was, the play's not good, good, but the hours are great. Yeah. yeah. I actually wanted to dress them back up after he was finished with them, but I don't think that would work out too well. Yeah. Okay, should we do the next question? Next question, don't be shy. Yeah. We're all aliens. <laughs> well, that's uh, already There's no reason why uh, pregnant the cat don't have English Pardon? Is there a reason why Crichton and the Cat don't have English accents? Um, we, you go first. Oh, I answered this before. I, I tried it in English, and it just didn't work really. The, the rhythm of the way it was written, it, it didn't work with, with an English accent. You know, the, the certain words that he was saying, they just didn't sound right in an English accent. Um, uh, we didn't mess around, you know, trying to fight, but you know, it was just the American accent was working for the, the, the sort of rhythm of the writing. And that's what we went with, basically. And you, I mean, you went through about 15 different yeah. uh, accents, didn't you? In, in the show. In the show, <laughs> every week. <laughs> every scene. <laughs> yeah. no. I mean, the reason I didn't want to do it in English was because of the, uh, because of things like C-3PO and uh, Marvin the Paranoid Android. You know, there were sort of very posh English butlers, um, butler-type robots. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do it Scandinavian for a while, but that drove me really crazy. Yeah, he was, he was Swedish at one point, wasn't he? He was Swedish. Yes, going to be called Crichton. Oh, hello, Mr. Fidelita. I've got very good side impact balls. Yeah, it's going to be that sort of thing. He would have had very good groinal attachments, probably. They'd be Swedish, wouldn't they? Yeah. Well designed. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so we ended up sort of a weird sort of, I don't know what it is, really. Just whatever it is, whatever it came out of. 
And that was sort of easy, it sort of stuck and, and it kind of got hold of us. Now, it wasn't like a conscious plan that you, you didn't have a sort of conscious plan, they've got to be American characters. No, it was, it was never written, was it? It was never written. No, there was no character or country written on. Yeah. He didn't say, "Oh, well, the Canadian crowd and could walk in away." Yeah. yeah. Uh, for Rob, uh, you worked on Spitting Image. Was uh, Red Dwarf conceived uh, during your time on that, or was it done afterwards? Uh, it was. That we actually we started work on the, the first season of Spitting Image halfway through it, um, and. When that finished in the summer, that's when we wrote the Red Dwarf pilot. Um, and we spent another two years on Spitting Image trying to hook the pilot around. One time Spitting Image were going to sort of produce it under their own arm, or they said they would. I think that was just a, an enticement to keep us on there. Um, so it was, it was around, it, and the pilot was around in 1983 and didn't go on the air until 1987. We actually, uh, we started rehearsing, I think it was in, Early in uh, 87. Yeah. End of 86. End of 86. And uh, we were all set to go. We thought, great, this is a dream. It's been four <laughs> years. And the electricians went on strike at the BBC and nothing got recorded. So we thought that was the end of it. But then they bumped it onto the next year. And, uh, oh, man. That, when, we, when they, with that room, when they went to and said, series is over, that was the, you know, and then they said, it's back on. And then we was all hyped up again. And then they went, it's back off again. It was like two, yeah. how many times, it was three, I know it was three contracts before we actually got to make it. Yeah. We, we had, we, two contracts were like uh, deleted. And you won't believe this when you look at the pilot, but uh, that show was rehearsed sort of for a year. So, <laughs> yeah, you imagine what it would have been like if we'd done it the first week. That's right. <laughs> no, but it, maybe it was a blessing in disguise. Because yeah. I think that, you know, uh, it, it could have been pretty stressful, I think, doing it off straight off because we didn't, you know, we, we weren't really su as sussed as we was when we actually made it. No. You know, when we made it, we really knew what had to be done with it, you know, and so in a way it was probably a blessing. Rob, are you going to continue doing collaborations with Doug or would you like to do some stuff on your own later? Well, we're, we've actually started doing separate stuff for, we had an operation last year. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we have a zipper now on our side, so we zip it when we need to work together. Uh, but we we're doing uh, different stuff now for a change, yeah, so interesting. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Darren from Bewitched, I noticed there are two Crichtons. Uh, the first one was in one episode, and uh, I'm assuming Crichton wasn't originally planned to be a regular cast member. I'm just wondering what happened with that. And, uh, how Robert Rowan came into the show? Um, well, I, uh, Doug was very pro having uh, Crichton come back, and I liked the character, uh, but I was against having a robot, and I thought it was corny having a robot in, and I was right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he twisted my arm and we wrestled a bit, and he won, and, uh, and then as soon as I saw Robert, I thought it was a good idea. So, uh, so yeah, it was amazing. Robert was actually hired with about, I don't know, about two hours to go before they yeah. recorded. Yeah. And he was doing a show in Edinburgh at the, uh, at the festival up there. And uh, so he couldn't even attend the rehearsals for filming or all of the filming. So we had to, uh, if you want to check your, uh, your tapes um, in time slides and a little bit of backwards, Robert's got a completely different accent. And I think in some cases we had to redub it. Because he was doing it badly. You know, no, he was doing it in an English person, it did sound a bit through C3 to Of course, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. no rehearsals at all. No, and, and it was the same with Holly, we sort of had two cast members just thrust upon us at the last minute. Yeah. About? Season 7, will Holly be back? Um, we, we haven't really decided yet whether or not to find the ship the next season. Um, but we are seriously thinking of having at least one holly back. Maybe two. Uh, we haven't really decided yet. You think it would be that easy? You would get it out of me that easy? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Anymore. Next question, this one over there.
I like the silent bit when the microphone's getting yeah. close because it makes me really relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> makes me less nervous also. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if each of you would, would uh, tell us a little bit about if there were any science fiction influences in, in the past, before the show, or if after the show you discovered big things in science fiction, if there weren't before. Um, well, I, I've, I've been a, a big science fiction fan uh, for well, since my early 20s. Long time ago. Um, I remember reading a short, an Arthur C. Clarke short story at school, The Star, uh, which, which blew me away. And I read a lot of um, John Wyndham, and you know, The Midwich Cuckoos, and The Daily Triffids, and H.G. Wells at school. Uh, but I didn't really get into more something that was written this century until uh, until a friend um, gave me a couple of uh, Hugo ones and uh, I got hooked and I, uh, I read it voraciously. I, I just can't get enough science fiction. Um, so all science fiction is an influence to me. I have every episode of uh, The Next Generation on tape. Take it, Danny does not. <laughs> ah, good luck, like Danny. I don't know. Have you, have you, do you know what science fiction is, then? I was a big science fiction fan. I didn't know it when I was. I mean, I watched all those, uh, you know, uh, Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet and Star Trek. And I, I was always into those kind of movies, you know. Um, but, it's, you know, in my career, I mostly played spacemen. I'm the space man in time, Captain Ebony. Now that's an interesting name. Where do you think that came from? Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think, God, you know, the writer was really pushing for a name there, wasn't he? Captain Ebony, right? Uh, we, need a, we need a name for a black guy. <laughs> Captain White, no. Captain uh, Yellow, no. Uh, yeah, Captain Ivory. Ebony. Ebony. Obviously, there are no musical influences. <laughs> Eddie Murphy, Saturday Night Live. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think but the influences for me would be. Um, Certainly, 2001 was really, uh, I saw more times than I should have done, probably. You know, more times than is healthy for someone. I was, I, I was high. Really. I just love that voice. I love that voice. I am completely operational and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. Mm. I, I think Hal was quite an influence on, on uh, Crichton's voice, really, and I was fascinated by that film, absolutely. And I think that got me uh, interested in it. I mean, I was a... A Terminator head, without question, because that, that inspired a play that I wrote, or helped inspire a play sure. I wrote, which is which Paul Jackson saw, who was the producer of Red Dwarf, who's introduced me to Robin Dubs. I mean, that was a fairly. I wrote a play about a robot that was um, supposed to be the perfect man, and turned out to be rather like every other man on the planet, and i.e., not so perfect. Um, uh, and I do I do read the science fiction now, but not possibly not as much as some people do. <laughs> I didn't realise that Paul actually saw you first as well before yeah. you joined the show. I told you. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. That's the same thing. That's how I, you know, I... I We're just, discovering a lot about each other. Yeah, tonight. No, but, um, <laughs> the, you know, the original producer, um, he, he saw me in a play yeah. as well. Yeah. A, a musical. Because, um, and he came with Lenny. And I used to, was dancing in one of Lenny's shows, and that's how I first met Paul. What about you, Joe? Did you meet Paul as well? I think I just lost it there, but I have met Paul Jackson, but he had never seen me in a play. A actually, this is sort of a loaded question for me because I actually work in science fiction, um, but I started reading things like The Lord of the Rings when I was in third grade, uh, things like The Tripods, which long before it became a crappy BBC One series. Um, and so I've been reading it uh, as far back as I can remember, but it's really only been in the last five or six years that I've actually made a career out of it, so I suppose that'll do until I can find a legitimate career. <laughs> Should we go for the next Yeah. Part? There's lots over there. There's, I think there's lots over there. They're cameras. They're, I thought there's all those cameras. Keep your hands up if you want to ask a question so they can give you the microphone. I noticed that 
red dwarf is not as technophobic as Doctor Who or Blake Seven, as much as I love those shows. You seem to have a more positive attitude toward technology. I wonder if you could comment on that. <coughs> Well, I, it's not something that I was conscious of, but I suppose it, it's true. I, I mean, I, I'm a great champion of technology. I, I think you know we can uh, we can save the planet with technology because we can't save it with anything else. Um, and I, I, I think my my mission in life is to 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 try and get people to a position where they can operate the timer on the VCR. Um, <laughs> If just ten people can do it, I'll be happy, you know. <laughs> Where does Talky Toaster fit into this then? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Toaster was smart. Yeah. Yeah. She's sort of gone on to another science fiction yeah, series. Yeah, well, we, Doug and I took over as executive producer for a sort of uh, promotion. Uh, uh, we, we shot some extra footage and wrote some extra scenes with um, a new Rimmer, a guy called Anthony Fusco, and uh, a new cat who was Terry Farrell. And that was one of these network things. They said, you've got to have a woman on the show who shows her neck. And, uh, and so we, we cast Terry Farrell, and we, as soon as we saw her, you know, we thought, she's great. Took it, took went into the NBC executives when we, we did the sort of dog and pony show and presented the uh, promo and, and brought the cast in for them to do a reading and everything. And uh, before Terry came in, he said, now listen up, this girl is so gorgeous and I want that to distract you from the fact that she's really good. And uh, I, again, that would have been okay. It wouldn't have been, the Red Dwarf we made in England, but then why make that again? You know, I think it would have been a good show and it would have found its own identity. And I think NBC were insane not to take it. Um, and I don't know how Danny felt about it, not good as you Well, I, I, I'm powerless in a situation like that, man. But uh, it was funny because Hit and Battle, were, as when I was a young dancer, was actually one of my kind of heroes, you know, because obviously you guys might not know, I was, you know, you might not know him because, you know, he's more of a theatre man. And, but through I was in musical theatre, I knew who he was, you know, 12 years ago. Um, you know, he was like one of the youngest Broadway stars. He was like, he was on Broadway at 17, you know, in The Wiz. He played the scarecrow in The Wiz when he was 17 on Broadway. And he's Diane Ross. And, yeah, all that. And, and he's like, uh, he, he's just like he was the man when it comes to uh, musical theatre. He was the man. You know, I mean, he he was he used to get parts that weren't written for white guys. You know, uh, for, for black guys. He, he was in Miss Saigon. He got a, uh, a Tony for Miss Saigon, and in, you know, 
to White Park, basically, in, uh, in London. And he played it on Broadway and got a, a Tony. Um, but, you know, you know, going to uh, a part that's already been done is always difficult. I mean, Rob will tell you, you know, the, the, the fear and, you know, the fact that someone's done it before you. And I've been in that situation, been an understudy many times. You know, you've got to go into a guy and you know, you stand up and stand and go, shit. <laughs> you know, you're looking at him thinking, God, I'm on tomorrow night, you know. And he's singing the roof down and, you know, so, so, so it's pretty daunting. It, uh, even when Rob took over, you know, I was like, damn, you know. Because David Ross was so good, you think, you're thinking, how are you going to match that? You know, and then Rob comes in, you go, jeez, you know. I've, ne I've never seen anyone take over a part and actually, you know, add to it. Uh, like Rob did, you know, because I, I must admit, I was thinking that after working with David Ross doing Crichton, I thought, God, you know, they're never going to get no one to do Crichton like that. And then when Rob did it, you just like, you know, I still can't look at him with the mask on, you know. It's like, you look at, every time he puts the mask on, you look at him, you think, it's still strange to look at him with the mask on. It, it, you never get used to it. You know, you always look at it and you just end up, you're staring at him. And, and you forget that it's Rob under there, you know. And you sort of check it, oh God, it's just a mask, you know. But it does come alive. But, uh, hey, listen, man, if I'm, if I'm going to be famous in America, I'll be famous, you know, anyway. Karma, baby. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter really, because if it wasn't meant to be, you know, it wasn't meant to be. So, uh, you know, that was what two years ago. You know, I've done 16 shows since then. You know, I, I couldn't sit around thinking about Hollywood. You know, if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, I, then again, you know, in the early days, you know, they've been saying they've been talking about Red Dwarf going to America since 1987. You know, and if I'm right. Um, HBO were the ones that said, oh, you know, we like Red Dwarf, and they, they were interested in me playing the cat. And uh, they weren't interested in anyone else. So, you know, one station might have, you know, wanted that, but another station might have wanted this. And, you know, the amount of people that have said they want to take Red Dwarf to America, you know, I was just like, oh yeah, another one, you know. You know a million people have you know, said that, that it was going to happen. So I, I stopped sort of thinking about it. After about 88. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh. not a problem that you had though later on, Rob, when you started bringing it around places because wherever you went, whoever the prospective buyer would be had a different concept of what Red Dwarf should be. Oh, yeah, definitely. We, uh, I mean, in the, we got a lot of it interest from America from the second season onward, and, uh, but it generally tended to be sort of fat guys coming over here and taking us out for expensive lunches and saying, do you really need a dead man in it? <laughs> that, that's kind of negative, you know? <laughs> I'm serious, One guy came and said, love the show, love everything about it. Do you need a spaceship? <laughs> so uh, when the university came along and actually gave us a sane offer, you know, we snapped at it. Well, the name Red Dwarf was a bit controversial as well, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, it was. It was not politically correct enough. No, no. Vertically challenged thing. <laughs> It's a, it's a, the, the, when I first arrived to do the, to, I got off the, the plane in Los Angeles to do the pilot, and the guy who drove me in the, the, the big stretchy thing, a big long car thing, one of those funny things, every time I, he said, what, what show are you in? I said, Red, Red Dwarf. And he goes, Red, Red Dwarf? Red Dwarf? And I said, yeah, Red Dwarf. It's, it's a show, it's about set in a spaceship, so it's not about dwarves. It's, it's, <laughs> And at, like an hour later, he's still driving, and he just, we talked about you know the weather and California and you know the president, and then he suddenly got red, red dwarf. <laughs> just, just couldn't get it into his head, you know. Has anybody? How many people have read Robert's book, The Man in the Rubber Mask? Oh, okay. I suggest that you try very hard to find a copy of this because the the last couple of chapters are a wonderful retelling of his adventures in America doing the pilot. And it's great to get a British perspective on the American television system. And it's very funny. Thank you very much, Jane. It's very nice. It's gone. Uh, uh, there were, I was actually, there's, there's somewhere there are 200 copies of it in a box. I think in, uh, in uh, Des Moines, probably. <laughs> they sure as hell ain't in, in Chicago. <laughs> I don't know where they are. Just bring well, they call it the Windy City. They just blew right by. <laughs> they just blew right by. So you might find one on the street one day. Oh, sorry? It's, it, it is in the digital, I know, yeah. Mine were going to be cheaper. 
<laughs> you have to mortgage your house to buy it. Yeah. Okay. Question. There's a question here. Yeah. Um, Danny, I was reading in one of your bios that you uh, were in the great Muppet Caper. Yeah. I was wondering, what did you do in the movie, and how did it feel working with the Muppets and with Jim Henson? Um, yeah, it was good. Uh, I was one of the dancers in the number Miss Piggy did in the in the, uh, the sort of ballroom type restaurant. Um, and then I worked in the room again on Labyrinth. So I liked Jim. He gave me another gig. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that's, that was an experience. You know, as far as uh, technical, you know, watching all that side of it, it was just mind blowing. And you know, it was not not a completely different aspect because you know you've got to try not to watch the puppeteers because you know you'd be dancing with this guy around the floor. You know, so you know you have to you know consciously try not to look at them. So it was a different kind of technique, really. You couldn't, <laughs> you know, it was hard not to look at them. But you know, when you're sort of dancing, and then the guy sort of rolls past you on a, on a chair and wheels, you know, oh. So, but it, that was crazy. That was like. 40 of the maddest people, you know, all the dancers, the crazy guys that been down at um, L Street. So just Danny was also in a movie, which you don't hear about much, called Scum. And uh, Danny actually was some of the scum, wasn't he? I was, I was a big bag of scum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about 15 in that film. Uh, I, I, I kind of did a few moody looks in it, that's about it. <laughs> but Danny's also in a... <laughs> And it was about all of you. There's this brilliant film show which was when he was about 10, which was made by the Notting Hill Police um, Station about Scotland youth. Scotland Yard. Yeah, Scotland Yard about youth crime. Youth, uh, it was a crime prevention film. A crime prevention film. It's called Seven Green Bottles, and they, the idea was they fell off one by one, and that's what happened. It just showed you that these guys getting in trouble. But if you ever get, you should bring, you ought to bring, I'm going to bring, bring it here, actually, because you'll see. It's only half an hour long, but you'll die. You'll see some early, the early appearance of a cat. Yeah. What do you mean, man? Everything like that, you see? But there's one scene, there's one scene which is very Danny where he's meant to look at something and then leave. It's supposed to be sort of he goes, look at the thing, and then go off, and it's Danny going. <laughs> and he comes back, and then he goes, come back. <laughs> Just goes on. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen that before. <laughs> no, what it, no, what it was, he was. Mine, um, that's was mine, that's mine, mine. It was, the, it was the end of the scene, we were talking about, you know, oh, we just, we just, we just stole in a car and we'd been in a car accident and, you know, we were sort of at the local disco, you know, and we were sort of talking about, you know, oh, as you already know, and then we are supposed to walk off, and I was drinking a Pepsi, and you could see the actor in me, you know, hamming it up, you know, and, the, you know, I, I, I was drinking a Pepsi, and then they leave, and I leave, and then enter back in, <laughs> it's so hard, I tell you. But it looked good. Danny, <laughs> <laughs> we, we all know how shy and tired you are. You're basically just a modest, modest fellow. But would you please uh, demonstrate the various parts that you use, the voices that you use to make up the cat? The cat? You did it last year. I, um, I like the Jane Fran. Right, the, 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 the voice is uh, taken from a, an actor, That's another, another hint and battle type. You know, uh, his name was Clinton Derricks Carroll. Uh, uh, he's another sort of musical stage man, really. He was in Five Guys and MO and all that kind of stuff, and uh, Dream Girls and things like that. I don't know if you know those shows, but. Um, and he, he used to warm up before the show, and I was understudying him. You know, he's a guy, big voice, you know, been in all the shows, amazing singer, um, and he used to warm up before the show. And what he used to do, he used to do, a, he used to mimic James Brown uh, as a warm up. So he'd like be shuffling around, you know, I'm all doing all this stuff. So basically, you know, when it, when it came to, down to the voice, it was kind of that the rhythm, the attack, is really kind of Richard Pryor, but the, the voice itself is a, an imitation of Clinton Derrick's Carroll mimicking James Brown. <laughs> so that, I mean, that's basically, that's why everyone always sees James Brown, even though I didn't directly take, you know, James Brown. <laughs> See, James Brown's more, you don't really understand what he's saying. But it, it, uh, 
Clinton, he would you know vocalize it much more. He wouldn't you know, do all that way. But he'd be more dealing with the screams, the hey, jump back. You know, you can, that's the only thing you can understand. You know, hey, jump back. That's the only thing you understand is hey. You know that. So that's where it basically came from that part. Because he never used to do it. He just used to do the screams and the yelps. And, and so basically it's that. Uh, it is influence uh, of James Brown, but through someone else. So then where did Dwayne come from? <laughs> Dwayne? He was a kind of, I mean, he was kind of a, the cat with um, a bit of uh, Nutty <laughs> Professor. Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis. <laughs> you, know, it, it, you know, because the character was based on Jerry Lewis, you know, and, you know, the voice, you know, when he, he kind of talks from his nasals, you know, uh, he, he kind of talks through his nostrils, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, it's kind of like that, but I'm trying to keep a bit of the cat's voice in it, you know, as well, to make him not sound so, um, you know, piercing, but, but, you know, too whiny, um, yeah. Queen, did it? You know, it's kind of more, it's half and half, you know. I tell you, it's hard for Danny to look at a Crichton when I've got the mask on. It is extraordinarily hard to look at Danny. Yeah, he couldn't look at me in. for about half an hour when I first came out on set. We were on the floor choking. We I couldn't mean, move. <laughs> when we first saw those teeth. I mean, he heavy actors, you know, there's a guy called Tim Timothy Spall who's like, you know, really heavy actor. Around, yeah. You know, he could, he, at first he was having trouble and, you know, they're the kind of guys don't corpse ever. Yeah. You know, Tim Spall, they're yeah. corpse, you know, they, they just... <laughs> Danny just turned around. Yeah, they were. And, and, Tim, <laughs> and then just, uh, Tim's first take was just, you know, you know, he, this guy's, you know, respected in his, you know, as an actor. And his first take on Red Dwarf, you know, you may as well have, he may as well have been drunk. Yeah, yeah. couldn't do it. He all. just went... Because <laughs> <laughs> Rob came out and went... Um, Calm down. Can you do some acting? Calm down. Yeah. Calm down, mate. It was really, it was really ner unnerving yeah. watching yeah. a guy of that kind of calibre being having to be told to, you know, oh, take it easy, man, relax, and you know, because you know, I found that a lot of people who do come on Red Dwarf, they do feel a bit in intimidated because the, the 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 set, the crew, the cast, everybody's so tight together, you know. And I was speaking to someone today, like you know, in America, there's this kind of crew cast. Wardrobe, everyone's kind of like, you know, you don't go into anyone's territory. And it's so different in, in England, you know, because, you know, you'll see, you know, the guy that plugs in the light sitting at the same table as Chris Barrett, you know, and, or Rob Chris Stone. won't talk to him, but he's there. Yeah. <laughs> he's on his mobile, I he's on his mobile. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll time make next time next voice out the door. I'd like to buy a Rolls Royce, make it two Rolls Royces. Uh, what's the time? Yeah, and a Porsche. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, that, that's, and when you come into that, you know, it, it is, I, I can understand I'm nerving. Um, I, mean, yeah, yeah. I have a question for Rob. Uh, where are you? <laughs> are they? Here. <laughs> um, the blooper tape we saw earlier shows a different ending for Out of Time that was dropped and uh, kind of last minute sort of thing, and we were wondering um, why and what reasons were involved with changing the ending. Um, I, I voted against changing it, and that's the only way to put on it, and I thought it was cruel because, I mean, at the time we didn't even know there was going to be another season, for sure. And I said, I don't, you know, if, if, it, if for any reason, you know, something goes wrong and we can't do it in the season, I don't want to leave it. There's a cliffhanger like this, like, and Blake said and everybody. Because <laughs> that, that hurt me when that happened. Um, but um, it was generally felt that it was uh, it was a good idea to, to leave it like that because we've never uh, had a cliffhanger ending and we do it every season and uh, next gen, don't we? Um, and they actually had to we, we we got a prize for blowing up Starbuck. Uh, it was something like, it was something ridiculous, like a hundred thousand dollars to just to take one model shot of Starbuck blowing up. And uh, they actually electronically generated the explosion of blowing up Starbuck um, in in post production for about two and three So, uh, uh, and as to whether or not we'll ever use that ending again, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think it will probably be different when we come to uh, 
to do the next series. But didn't that work better in a sense? Because I was saying before, Rob, that the, since the episode is recorded in front of a live audience, everybody knew the ending. So here you had an ending that nobody knew about. So there was much more of a mystery as to what happened. Well, yeah, that was um, uh, that was the big argument that, that went through, really. Yeah. Uh, but I, I still think it's crap. I mean, you gotta wait like two years in between the series. You don't need a cliffhanger like that, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question for Rob. Uh, I wanted to know what, it, what uh, went into making Backwards as a story, and uh, also, can you kind of recount the tale as to why the Red Dwarf disappeared, and do you know where it is now? Well, I know where it is, but nobody else does. Um, the idea of Backwards just came, just came out of this, like most uh, ideas that work. Um, it was just a very simple premise of what if what if the end of the universe where time is running backwards and uh, the whole thing kind of logically flow on from there. I know there are a couple of uh, there are actually a couple of errors about the backwards uh, logic, um, but on the whole, it, it is a logical progression. Once you get that idea, the other ideas follow, um, and when you start thinking like, well, backwards war is a good idea actually. And, uh, uh, that's interesting, um, and we didn't really, excuse me, we didn't get, really get much chance to explore the some of the very interesting implications of time running backwards, and we hope to do that in uh, in the third novel. But then uh, this guy called Martin Ennis came along and, and wrote a, a book called Time's Arrow, which was precisely about the same thing and cuts across all the same ground because it's basically because once you've got the idea, the other ideas are. Uh, you can derive logically like ge geometric rules really. Um, but it was, uh, it was a hell of a show to shoot because uh, at the time, I mean, it's, it's much easier now we have digital uh, editing facilities and things, but at the time it was all analog and the, the tapes couldn't read time code running backwards and the engineers were going crazy and uh, <laughs> it was not a popular show. Uh, but there was some, it, it was good fun to shoot. Um, I remember uh, Robert and uh, Chris walking backwards down the street in uh, in Manchester, um, and Robert was in his uh, robot outfit, and Chris had his big H on his forehead, and nobody looked at him twice. And walking backwards down the middle of the street, nobody looked. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a cameo shot of Rob Grant in that shot, there, isn't there? Yeah, I'm actually in that shot. Oh, yeah, that's that's I make an appearance in. Yeah. Yeah. Smoking, unsmoking a cigarette. Unsmoking. <laughs> I saw, the, I saw the guy, one of the stunt guys, who unrumbled the bar. Yeah. Yeah, that was funny. I uh, worked on a lot of people. Uh, another science fiction job I just did. And uh, there was a stunt man, he was in the unrumble, and I went into him, and as soon as I said, bar unrumble, you know, and he knew what I mean. Oh, we're cool. <laughs> the stunt man. Yeah, that was funny. Um, and the other part of the question, um, I know where a dwarf is, and uh, nobody else does. <laughs> Rob, when you created uh, the characters and stuff, did you ever have the images that you would have the impact of uh, phrases and images of the characters that Star Trek, Doctor Who, have on the people of uh, convention and all over the world? And, and did you? Yeah. Did you? Did you, did you, did you have the image in your mind that you may be creating something as, as great as Star Trek? Well, yeah, you, you dream that, but you dream that, you know, you're also dreaming you're going to meet the gorgeous woman around the corner who's going to force you to throw yourself on her, but um, <laughs> I, I class it with, with that in, in the realms of reality. You know, I, I was just saying while we were doing the auction before that I remember at the first show thinking that all these props are around here, I'm going to collect all these props and, and take them home and, and one day they're going to be real famous and then we'll get a lot of money. And I thought, nah. God, if I had known, I'd tell you, I'd have had to try out the every studio there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I felt like it would, it would kind of been tempted fate to do it anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, so. That's right, because everyone expects to, you know, they always say, you know, you must have loads of costumes, and, yeah, and it's not true at all, is it? It's, yeah. No, you know, because Howard always used to say, well, you never know, you might get another series next year, you know. And I go, oh, yeah. You know, imagine, you know, trying to find your gear, you know, it's terrible.
so the answer is, you know, you dream that kind of stuff, but you don't really expect it to happen. You know, I, I dreamt, uh, you know, I might be here, but never really expected it. Uh, so, no, any more questions? Yeah. yeah. This is for Rob. I was wondering what's going on with the third original novel, The Last Human. Are you working for Penguin? I keep getting asked this question, they've sent spies. Um, we, we, uh, we were supposed to publish it, I think, um, a year last July, so we're a little behind. Even more behind than we normally are. Um, How'd you get away with that? With ourselves. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, In a nutshell. <laughs> And uh, we, we hope it's going to be ready for the spring uh, in hardback um, and I know Penguin uh, are doing a big, uh, it's, it's like 400 years of Penguin books isn't it? <laughs> um, this year and uh, they want to have, they want to release the paperback um, in the fall. So that, that's the schedule. The cover is printed though. It's a nice cover. The cover is it's a year and a half old. The cover, I, I, th I think it's changed since. The... It says provisional date January '95 on it. So <laughs> it's when, when we get it finished, really. There's a question there. I have a question about uh, characterization. Um, Sheldon Cooper's character is very strong in the People that you knew in your life, you just wanted to make fun of. Well, in a way, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the names of the characters, we, we wanted to make it sound like it was a convincing bunch of people who, who could conceivably uh, have been together. So we named all the crew from people from our class at school, because they're going to answer the same school, so that there was a lister. And there is a rimmer. <laughs> and uh, we got a letter uh, a year ago from, from Rimmer, and I'd heard from him in, I don't know, uh, 25 years. And he'd said that he'd, uh, he'd, see, he'd read the book and he, he wondered if the character was modelled on him. <laughs> and what could you say? Yes, you're the biggest asshole in the universe. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> We just took the name, we thought it was a good name, uh, uh, nothing to do with you, Arnie. And uh, <laughs> the big kicker is he, he's, um, he's a pilot in the RAF. <laughs> he's, he's, he's Howard, you know, he made it. He flies the royal family. Um, and, you know, Todd was, uh, was in our class as well. Uh, but the characters of, of Lister and Rimmer really were based on, on me and Doug. I mean, uh, yeah, and bits of both of us, we sort of mixed and matched various elements to call the sort of worst bits and made it rimmer and the even worst bits and made that lister. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we spent a lot of, we spent, we, we used to share a bachelor flat and, boy, was that a bit. <laughs> you know, using uh, oranges, half oranges as ashtrays, you know. And, uh, and then you hurry every night. night. Using the, the, the ashtrays as plates. And, <laughs> and, like, you know, it, was a, it really was a famously disgusting hole, so all that list of stuff came out of that. And we both had a little uh, kind of anal streak in us, we sort of uh, anally fixated. Uh, underwear on hangers? And, not, not quite that, no. The, the underwear's from the list of it. <laughs> um, but uh, the characters like uh, Holly and the Cat and, and Crichton, really, that's them. Uh, he didn't start off. As them. We, we started off sort of, uh, you know, we, we had vague characters in mind, and then well, what we do is we steal from reality. Um, and so we, we go around and pretend to be the friends. I'm pretending to be the friend right now. I'm your friend. And watch them, you know, and get their foibles and uh, the party tricks and the way they, their attitudes and stuff like that. And, uh, and then sort of bring their characters more into line with what they are. So, so much so that Bobby's just had a groin and socket fitted and uh, you're yeah. very comfortable with it. It's the DX517, it's really good, it's got this. For the technically minded, I'll show you later. <laughs> so that's a good question. If you want to look, you can go up to his room and uh, he'll let you in. We got time for another question or are we, yeah? Who yeah. is Rocket? Two more. Who is Rocket? Rocket. We had that today. Rocket is, uh, is our lead cameraman. We actually 
first used him in uh, the second season for some of the pre-filming on, uh, what's on the episode where, where they, of Stasis Lake. And uh, he's, he's a great, great cameraman and he, he runs the team and uh, he's called Rocky, this is a great stuff. Mm. Uh, because when he was a, a young trainee cameraman, he was shooting this uh, big royal fireworks. Uh, and his one job, the one job they'd given him, at the climax, they had this like $4,000 rocket that was going to have a big bang, you know, and spell the Queen's name or something. And uh, his job, he just had the camera there all the time, and just had to follow the rocket, which was going to take off that way. And when, it, the, when the moment came, he lost his head, he panicked, and he went off that way, and the rocket went off. And, uh, Ever since then, he's been called Rocky. This, this was the closing <laughs> shot that was going over the closing credits. It was going to be this big, dramatic, streaking rocket going. And they said, do you want to rehearse this? So you get it. No, 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 I get it. Do you want to rehearse it? No, I get it. They get to the shot. <laughs> yeah, he, he was like, a, one of, as we were having a conversation before about him, he was one of like the, the pioneers of pop videos. You know, he used to do all the Queen videos in the early days. He's the guy that sort of got that whole feel about actually being creative in a pop video. Um, and he's sort of a bit modest about it. But. Yeah, he told me an interesting fact. You know the uh, the video to Bohemian Rhapsody? That all those special effects are actually created in camera. That's not post-production, you know, all that, that head spinning around. That's actually did that in yeah. camera. And the reason that he still calls himself Rocket is because he still gets a lot of rock video gigs because the name Rocket, Rocket sounds a lot cooler. And so he says he's actually gotten jobs because people say it's a cool name and they hire him for that. And then every every weekend they go and uh, film uh, rugby. <laughs> they're, they're, they're doing Red Dwarf like old week, and then they'll say, "Oh, we're going off to do the rugby." You know, this guy's passing the ball down the line. You know? So versatile. We got one more there. Uh, this question is for uh, Rob Llewellyn. I was wondering if you had any uh, inspirations on uh, how you played the role of Crichton. It's very unique, but the one thing it sometimes reminds me of is a. Uh, Herman Munster from the Munsters. I don't know if you're familiar with that or that's intentional. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I have, yes, of course. Um, Herman Munster was a, a humongous um, influence on my early early life. I made a pair of Herman Munster cardboard uh, boots out of a cornflake packet. It didn't work very well. Um, I think the first time I, I realised it, it was written, I didn't think of it until I saw myself in the mask, and then I looked in the mirror and just went... <laughs> and it sort of took over. You know. Because I, I just think it suits the character. He's a kind of gentle, bumbling giant, and uh, you know that was what was lovely about the Herman Munster character was what was theoretically a frightening monster was a very friendly and loving sort of person. Which, uh, it's totally feasible, though. <coughs> so yeah, no, and I think one day, uh, one, one of the early recordings, I said to the audience, um, "I don't know if any of you know my uncle, Herman Munster," <laughs> and they all just, you know, they got it. Didn't they? So, you know, <laughs> Is that, uh, we have to go. Ready? Yeah, we're, we're out of here. Thank you very much for the Thank you. Good morning, America. I just, I've just got to ask you to, to, to remember to do your visions vote forms for next year. Please, please do your vote forms, or life isn't worth living.